that is just going to go into the landfill. Like I do not take on clients that do that work. I got two questions that are that are just bubbling in my head right now. So I want to jump to values in a minute because that that is right there. But I want to step back to conflict because you mentioned it and kind of danced around and mentioned conflict a moment ago. And that's an area you deal a lot with as well as I understand. So talk a, a little bit about the three areas of conflict that you deal with and how conflict can be used to reach better solutions. Okay. But let's get on conflict. Definitely. Yeah, great. So, um, yeah, I talked about this in in some a video for Mark Barden that we mentioned earlier, and this is not you know I can't take credit for this typology, uh, but uh, Eddie Jen, who's a fantastic researcher, uh, her, her actual I think her real first name is Karen, um, has kind of developed this typology of three main types of conflict that work teams experience, and the three types are task, relationship and process conflict. So just to go through them briefly, task conflict is conflict about um, what are we trying to do? Relationship conflict is more personal and emotional in nature. It's conflict between people about kind of non-work related stuff. And then there's process conflict, which um, can kind of bounce between the two a little bit. Uh, and it's conflict about how are we going to do what we're going to do. Process conflict often turns into relationship conflict if it's not handled the right way. So if if I'm consistently saying, "Hey, we are going to be on time for meetings," and then yet you know my friend uh, Jennifer is always late to meetings. At first, that's a process problem, but it quickly can become a, a problem where I'm, I'm reading into her character and I have an pr- issue with her right. as a human being. And that's relationship conflict. Relationship conflict is toxic for teams. It doesn't mean if, if you have relationship issues, you should not deal with them and like you should deal with them to help resolve them. That kind of conflict, it tends to lock down communication. It distracts from the task at hand. It it adds emotion to places where you actually need your brain to be more neutral and analytical. It's it, And it, it creates discomfort with everybody, even if you're not in the conflict. Task conflict, on the other hand, is great for teams. It's It's a signal that your team is actually talking about the issues that matter the most. And this is something that you and I care a lot about. Why are we doing what we're doing? Right. What are we trying to achieve together? What is our job in the world? The process conflict can go either way. It's a natural thing to happen. It's good to kind of try to anticipate what process what process conflicts might arise in the, in a group of this composition and how can we kind of create some kind of guidelines going in that will help avoid conflict so we don't waste our time. But, you know, that that one kind of can be dealt with and it, it needs to be dealt with. I see often some resistance around we don't want too much process. Well, guess what? Every team has process, just like every team has culture. Some people, resi- they don't want a lot of structure, but that's something that you can talk about. You can say, we want to keep things loose. Now, do we have agreement on that? Um, what does that mean to keep things loose? What things are we keeping loose? What things are we going to hold people accountable for? That can be dealt with. But yeah, task conflict is is fantastic. It's really it, it's highly, highly correlated with the creativity of a team. And that's a good thing. A good thing to front load your task conflict and kick you off in a good in a good place is to, to have a nice debate about what problem you're going to try to solve together and answer the why question. And then you're setting your constraint and your conflict will tend to be about is this idea actually solving that problem or is it not? And that's a great debate to have. That means that you're evaluating your ideas on the basis of usefulness. Uh, if you if you start off together and you're all, you know, rah-rah and lovey-lovey and you decide you all want to build a an app for music discovery for exercisers, then – you might be on the same page about what you think you're trying to build, but it ends up being pretty different um, once you actually build it, and and then relationship conflict can ensue. So, um, yeah, in my own research, I just found that that problem constraints tended to go with task conflict, and solution constraints tended to go with relationship conflict, and that conflict um, 
was an important reason why these teams ended up being more or less successful in terms of innovation. Right. Well, this has been on my mind a lot. I sit on a, a board that's going through a huge shift and the why question has been my primary question. You know, why do we exist? What are we doing? Why are we uh, here for the uh, for the members? And I've been mm-hmm. thinking of why as part of the process question as well, along with how. Hmm. Why do we do it? And then how do we achieve what we need to achieve? So your thoughts were in preparation for this would have been good for me to kind of bounce around as well. I th- I think that why is is so meaty. It's it's it is a task. It is a task form of conflict. Hmm. It's it's about the it's about the the content of the work and not the not the means by which to do right. it. Right. Right. And so that's how I differentiate between task and process. But it is a very blurry line and I think that you know, it's you could your subjective experience in which one it feels like matters, of course. But I tend to think of why as being one of those like pivotal uh task really task conflict type of a debates. Right. Well, it's hard for, at least for me, not to find that, as you said, it kind of gets gray or muddy because it's difficult to deal with process and sometimes task without the who being involved, the relationship. So it's just a dance. I feel like a constant dance in and out of managing the who's, getting back to the why's and how's and, and taking care of what's. And that's why, that's why these typologies are useful. Like as soon as you know, as soon as you know that there are three different types, you can kind of name them exactly. and you can talk about them as that type of conflict as a group, which helps make it less personal. And you can say, this is about, this is the issue that's about the person, but you know, that's not really where we should be spending our time. Let's talk about the task and maybe the people issues will go away. Right. And too frequently people go, in my experience, go into that relationship when it's not about who or the problem. Um, but that's an easier place for people to fall into. It seems, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately, um, let's jump back to the values because uh, I was all excited, just kind of jumping up and down as you were going in that area as well. In the process of doing impactful creative work, it seems like that's an area that some, at least some creative people struggle with is, can they separate themselves, their values from what they're doing? I just want to hear some of your experiences around making sure your values align with the people you're working with. I mean, that's something that seems to be very strong in your, in your work, in the culture of you. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know if you're, if you work hard and even if you don't always work hard, I mean, I certainly don't always work hard, but, um, I try to show up, you know, I try to be, to bring myself and I try to be honest about my strengths and weaknesses and when I'm up and when I'm down Um, it gives me options and, and the best way to weed through my options about which opportunities I want to pursue and which ones I don't, or who I want to spend my time with is, do I, do I trust this person? Do I like this person? Are they going to be fun? And I don't, I don't have fun with mean people. Amen. You know, like I really don't, (laughs) I'm, I'm a Taurus. Like I'm really stubborn. I, I have a hard time getting over things. If someone wrongs me. It's really hard for me to get over it. So I just, I found like, I I keep trying to convince myself or in, you know, maybe in my twenties, I would keep trying to convince myself like they just did this for that reason. And they did this for that reason. And then it's like, but yeah, but I'm surrounding myself with all these people that it's like the the writing's on the wall. Like it's not going to go well. So it's not a favor to them if I'm making excuses or, you know, it's just a basic incompatibility. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, that, that somebody that I'm a, I'm a misfit for is, is a misfit for everybody or that they're a bad person. It's just that I found that like, when you, when you, when you just go with what smells good to you, your intuition is so much smarter than any analysis that you could ever do. So if you just work with people that you like, they tend to be people that you're going to do good work with. Yeah. Agreed. It doesn't mean you have to like them, you know, but I think you sometimes, sometimes there's people who frustrate me like crazy, but I'm somehow fascinated with them as I would be with like an interesting actor in a, in a movie. And those are good people to work with too. You know, you want people who stretch you, but I, I think the values thing is, is the thing that is, is most important to me. So when I'm picking which clients I want to take on, the first question I ask myself is at the end of the day, 
if this company succeeds, if I help it to grow and to like achieve its mission, what will be the net effect on the world? Because I want, you know, my job is to make these companies succeed. So if the net effect is people will buy more stuff and this company will make more money, I'm not really compelled by that. And that's in fact going to be something that I'm going to feel like I want to change about the company. And I'm just honest with myself about that. And so that's not a company that I would choose to work with. If I say, you know, if the answer is more like people will have access to um, a better financial future at all levels of society, that's something I can get behind. I'm willing to stay up late for that. You know, I'm willing to like forego time with my family and exercise and all of the other things I could be doing in order to do that because that really matters to me. And so I, I pick really, I, mission is, is, is number one, team is number two. Um, and then is the business model going to work? Is the product, is there traction? Those are like v- very distant thirds. But if you have a good team and they're trying to solve an important problem, that's, you know, I think that's what a lot of VCs look for. And that's what I look for. Yeah. About probably four or five years ago, I was having a mutual break up with a client and we just reached a point where we realized that we're not going the same direction. And I sat down one morning and just as I was journaling and five values just kind of poured out on paper quickly and they have been massaged and organically slightly changed over the years, but they've become the foundation of all of our decisions of how we work, who we work with. And the first one has become, you know, work with abundant minded people. But the way it started out was only work with nice people, never work with mean people. And it was out of that that value that I realized nice people have an abundance to their thinking about how they work. Mm. And mean people, from my point of view, work from a scarcity mindset. Mm-hmm. They're always they're always afraid. And yeah, where I think mean comes from is is more it comes out of an anger or fear or insecurity of scarcity. Oh yeah, that's great. There's never enough. And I realize working with people who see the world from there is never enough. There just is never going to be enough. As you were talking about that, that that resonated from that perspective is that yeah, nice people have a have a it's as tried as it sounds, they've got a nice view of the world. And boy does that make the day go just better. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And and they can see, I love that. And they can see opportunity. It reminds me of um, a quote I, I heard about, I don't know, like weight loss or something back when I really cared about that <laughs> when I was acting. It was fat people save energy, thin people waste energy. And I think that's like, that, that was like a huge breakthrough. It was like, if you are going to be a healthy, like functioning vibrant human being, you're not concerned about conserving who you are. You know, you're not, you're not, you don't have that like men- scarcity mentality about y- your ability to give. Right. And, and I, and I, you know, it's like, you see that also in, in the creative process so much that there's some people for whom ideas are free and abundant and there are too many to act on. I mean, and that is the case that really is the case for all of us. Yeah, they flow like water. We have, Oh, they do. They, I mean, they, they flow too quickly for us to ever be able to use all of them. And I, I love startups whose mission is to help distribute ideas so that those who can find them useful can do something with them because no one needs to hoard their ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, there will always, the more you let out, the more that will come to you. Exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. They just, they self-generate. Completely. I mean, it's a, uh, there's, there's like this vacuum theory that if you want, if you're like, if you're desperate, you really need a new couch and you somehow can't get together the money. The best thing you can do is get rid of everything else you have to sit on and a couch will appear. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I love that. I mean, I think, and I, I've done that so many times in my life where I, I look, I, I leap before I look because I, I've been looking already and I haven't found. And so I'm like, but I still want that thing. And so I'm going to just move to Europe without a job. Five days later, I figured out a way to make money. I figured out somewhere to live and here I am, you know, you know, sometimes I prepare a lot. Sometimes I I find that preparation is getting me nowhere and then you just have to like leap, but you have to have that attitude that like, if you give to the universe and you trust and like things are going to come to you. 
I totally believe that. Yeah. Those are the best people to work with. They're like those that any idea that you say out loud, they can think of how it connects to some 